So thanks so much. Um, so this is actually very preliminary and tentative um, because I don't normally work on non-human animals. So please um, bear with me. And it also does rely on um, sort of giving an explication of others' work. So as you'll see, you know, I'm going to go through um, some of the conceptual analysis of oppression from the feminist literature and so on as part of this talk. So um, like Ben, I'm, I was one of the questions I'm interested in in sort of preliminary thinking about this is what's the point of talking about oppression as opposed to um, morally wrongful treatment or injustice in the case of um, non-human animals? Um, and some people have tried to answer that question. So some of you might be um, aware of Jason Wyckoff's work uh, where he responds to Singer and he says that the language of oppression, particularly structural oppression, can be useful because oppression is what he calls a manifestation of hierarchy. And then if we think about the notion of structural oppression that's familiar from Iris Marion Young's work, um, this might also be relevant for um, non-human animals, as, as Wyckoff points out. So structural oppression is not just sort of focused on individual treatment or, or violence, but rather is the product of norms, habits, symbols and social practices, and not necessarily of people's choices or intentions. So there's this distinction between agent oppression and structural oppression that some people make, including young. And uh, I'm just going to go back to seeing people because I turned you off and that's a bit alienating. <laughs> um, so anyway, this distinction between age and depression and structural oppression. As, as, and so it might be useful to sort of introduce the language of oppression because it's a way of capturing this sort of structural dimension of the moral problem of, of non-human animals. Um, Whereas, say, Singer, as uh, Kristen was pointing out and as Wyckoff points out at the beginning of this paper, you know, Singer characterises racism, sexism and speciesism as reducible to um, human attitudes, beliefs and prejudices. And as Wyckoff points out, the oppression of racism, sexism and perhaps speciesism, if we can extend that, um, isn't necessarily reducible to psych psychological states of human actors because there's sort of an institutional and hierarchical issue here. So one reason to introduce the language of oppression is to, um, you know, taking up from Singer's idea that we need to expand the circle and extend our conception of um, what's morally problematic from racism, sexism, and so on, speciesism, if you want to extend that, we might have to diverge from a psychological or, you know, prejudice-related uh, con conception of what's going on here or bias-related conception and move to a structural conception. So that's one reason to uh, start to think about oppression as opposed to simply um, morally wrongful treatment or injustice in a broad sense. Oops. Another reason to think about oppression is because of a notion that Sally Haslanger calls ideological oppression. So injustice and oppression and um, injustice towards non-human animals is, is no different. It's, it's very, very intractable. So one of the problems that several, you know, writers, many scholars, in fact, have noticed is that although we're aware that injustice takes place, nevertheless, the hierarchies that seem to justify the injustice and the perpetuation of the injustice is very much entrenched. So what um, Haslanger does at the beginning of many of her recent papers is to distinguish between what she calls repression, which is on the one hand um, forced on people through coercive measures and ideological oppression that is enacted unthinkingly or even willingly by the subordinated or privileged. And this idea of ideological oppression is, is quite useful because it helps us understand why oppression and hierarchy and inequality is so entrenched and just gets perpetuated um, 
um, in an unquestioned way, as, as Young puts her, or in, in almost in a willing way, as Haslanger puts it. So as she says, chattel slavery corresponds to repression, whereas gender oppression in the contemporary context, at least in the West, is largely ideological. As Haslanger puts it, men and women hardly notice their participation in practices that sustain men's privilege and power, and this makes it particularly intractable. Of course, some forms of oppression are hybrid forms. So there may be forms of gender oppression that are hybrids between repression and ideological uh, oppression, and oppression of non-human animals is probably um, a hybrid form of oppression. So the talk is going to be thinking about these two ways of uh, thinking about oppression um, as structural oppression on the analogy of um, sexist oppression on the one hand and then as ideological oppression. And I'm just going to have some very preliminary sort of brief remarks uh, about those two types of oppression. So first let me turn to um, structural, oh, I've just said that, so, uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, I mean, as people have said, you know, rhetorically, it's quite intuitive to think that the extension uh, to non-human animals of an oppression framework um, is, is, is appropriate. Um, but I guess what I want to suggest here is that extension isn't quite as um, easy to defend as it appears on its face. Um, and I'll look briefly at two approaches. One is the analysis of the concept of structural oppression from feminist philosophy. So I'll be looking at Fry, Young and Cudd, who are the main proponents of um, the notion of structural oppression in feminist philosophy. And I'll ask whether or how this conceptual analysis, analysis might be applied to species oppression. And then I'll look at ideological oppression and how it might apply to species oppression. So Fry first, I mean, as many of you will already know, I mean, Fry's, you know, developed this famous notion of structural oppression, which can be summarised as an enclosing structure of forces or barriers, which tends to the immobilisation and reduction of a group or category of people. And there are six um, necessary conditions which are jointly sufficient, or at least this is one way of interpreting it. Uh, the six necessary conditions are that oppression is a group-based phenomenon. So individuals can't be oppressed unless as members of groups. The, um, the, ph the phenomenon places limits on or barriers to freedom which are systematic, which means they're interrelated and mutually reinforcing and they're also harmful. Moreover, there is another group that benefits from the imposition of these barriers. And finally, this privileged group plays the role of enforcing the barriers. So the main point, I guess, is this, it's, I mean, there's harm and it's systematic and so forth, but the main point that I wanna mention here is that it's, according to this analysis, a group-based phenomenon. And that's taken up by, uh, Young's work as well, um, although Young obviously has a, a different and pluralistic conception of structural oppression where she argues that oppression has what she calls five faces of exploitation, marginalisation, powerlessness, cultural imperialism and violence. But it's also on Young's account a group-based analysis. So on uh, Young's account, oppression refers to structural phenomena that immobilise or diminish a group. And she also has in this famous article an analysis of a social group, the kind of group that is um, relevant for the conceptual notion of oppression being offered here. A social group is a collective of persons differentiated from at least one other group by cultural forms, practices or a way of life. Members of a group have a specific affinity with one another because of their similar experience. A social group is defined by a sense of identity. So that's Young. And then finally, in Anne Cudd's work, Analyzing Oppression, she outlines four conditions of structural oppression. The first is a harm condition, 
Again, the second is a, a social group condition. Harm is perpetrated on a social group whose identity exists apart from the oppressive harm of one. There's also a privilege condition. Another social group benefits from the practice in one. And there's a coercion condition. So there's some unjustified coercion or force that brings about the harm. So I outline these different, um, sorry, I outline these different analyses just to show that these uh, group-based analyses, um, which were defended to explicate the notion of women's oppression. So they explicitly rule out that men as a group are oppressed. So some people point to the harm that men suffer, the way in which, you know, men are um, harmed in virtue of having to conform, for example, to um, masculinist stereotypes and so on. But one of the points of these kinds of analyses is that even if that is the case and even if there is certain kind of harm which is to a certain uh, extent unjust, it doesn't constitute oppression because, in fact, in these analyses, men are characterised as the privileged group and women are characterised as the subordinated or oppressed group. And, of course, these analyses can be extended to other subordinated social groups such as uh, racialized groups. So there's no problem there as long as we can also identify a privileged group that benefits from the, um, the group-based harm that's introduced as a condition of these analyses. But there is a real question, I think, when we think about whether or not these kinds of analyses can be extended to non-human animals. Uh, so there are two obvious objections. The first is that when we think about other species or non-human animals, it's not the case they comprise a social group in the sense meant by these analyses. And then the second objection is that although humans benefit from the subordination of non-human animals, humans to core do not comprise a social group either. So there's no identifiable group or social group that's privileged. So going back again, if I can just go back, let's say, to, to Young. I mean, we could even change this to, the, we could have changed this definition to, say, individuals or something. We don't necessarily have to think of it as, as relying on the notion of persons, but we need to characterise social groups on her analysis anyway as, as um, in terms of cultural forms, practices or a way of life as being defined by a sense of identity. So this relates to some of the things that were said in Ben's talk. Um, you know, it's not clear that the subjective sense of um, non-human animals will be sufficient to um, enable us to characterise them as satisfying these kinds of conditions of social identity that are introduced here. Um, and as I say, there's this other problem, which is that if we need a privileged social group, it's not clear that humans altogether comprise a social group in any um, identifiable sense. So what, what are the possibilities? I mean, if you, if you go with me on that, well, what are the possibilities um, that we could... Uh, develop in response to that observation, um, that it, it's not clear that this group-based analysis of oppression is going to allow us to extend the analysis to non-human animals. What are the possibilities? Well, the first would be to conclude that non-human animals are not actually oppressed, although, of course, their treatment is morally egregious and unjust but you might want to, you know, resist that conclusion for all sorts of reasons, rhetorical reasons, um, you know, reasons of strategy and so on um, in, in social justice movements and so on. Um, so another alternative might be to argue that um, since there's this very strong um, in, intuitive and rhetorical case that non-human animals are in fact oppressed, 
the group-based analysis of oppression must be wrong. But of course, that's going to end up being problematic for um, feminist analyses of oppression and other analyses of oppression if we just sort of reject the group-based analysis. Um, so the other alternative might be then to re reconceive of the category of non-human animals so it meets or at least attempts to meet a social group criterion. So as far as I can tell, uh, Young and uh, Cud and so forth, when they talk about social groups are offering a descriptive criterion of groups based on shared experience and sense of identity that clearly non-human animals don't meet. So there might be different ways of um, characterising the relevant social group to retain this group-based analysis of oppression. Um, we could either, you know, try to, um, you know, define um, subsets of groups. That might be one way to go and retain a descriptive analysis or we could perhaps introduce a different kind of criterion of a social group, which isn't descriptive. So perhaps a normative criterion or perhaps a stipulative idea of what um, the relevant social group in the case of non-human animal is might be helpful. And I think this is implicitly anyway, the way that um, Wyckoff himself um, argues so what he suggests is that um, the concept animal or the category animal is a socially constructed concept on the model of Haslanger's definitions of gender and race. So if, you have, if, you, if this can be defended, if in fact animal is a socially constructed concept, then you could you know, try to um, characterise the um, category animal such that um, it's plausible to sort of plug it into the analyses of oppression that I just mentioned. So on his account, there are actually four conditions, but I'll only mention two of them here. Um, S is an animal if and only if S's observed bodily features are presumed to be evidence of non-membership in the species Homo sapiens. And then the second one is having such features marks S within the dominant ideology of human society as suitable to occupy a social position in which S's interests are lesser than those of humans. So if we adopt this kind of approach and characterise the category animal as a kind of socially constructed rather than a, rather than a purely sort of descriptive category, um, or stipulatively social, I should say, stipulatively socially constructed. We're, we're following in Haslanger's footsteps here and sort of positing a notion of animal because it serves useful theoretical purposes. If we do that, and as long as we do it in a way that doesn't include a reference to oppression, I have a few doubts about whether Wyckoff's um, own analysis actually succeeds in doing that, but I'm just going to set that aside for the moment. So as long as we um, introduce this sort of stipulative account of the category animal that doesn't itself include a reference to oppression, it might be able to be used to characterise the category non-human animal for the purpose of a group-based definition of oppression. But we would probably also need a parallel then socially constructed sense of human for this purpose. So human being, you know, referring to the category that occupies a social position which has um, superior interests or something to that effect. So that would be one way to go to, as it were, save um, the uh, extension of the notion of oppression um, from these feminist conceptual analyses to non-human animals. I don't think um, the extension works if you just rely on a descriptive notion of social group in terms of experience or sense of social identity uh, but it may work if we sort of recharacterize the notion of social group uh, in the ways suggested. Uh, the other way to go and this links to um, Wyckoff, I mean Wyckoff discusses Haslanger's um, ideological oppression as you see here one of the components of the socially constructed notion of animal is to try to unpack how animal is thought of in 
the dominant ideology of human society. So that's connected to the notion of ideological oppression, although I haven't quite connected it yet. I'm, I'm thinking here of ideological oppression as actually something separate. So that's what I'm going to move on to now. Um, so as I said, extending the feminist analysis of structural oppression to non-human animals isn't as obvious as it might appear and indeed looks as if it would require a revision of the social group criterion. So what about ideological oppression? So there's a close connection between ideological oppression and, and structural oppression, but the way in which Haslanger herself uh, characterises ideolo ideological oppression does not actually sort of presuppose this social group criterion. It doesn't appear to be a group-based um, analysis, although that's something I need to think a bit more about. I just sort of noticed that as I was reading about it for the purpose of preparing this. So this is something maybe to be discussed. But the, the way she talks about ideological oppression um, is um, in the following way. Um, ideology functions to stabilise or perpetuate unjust power or domination and does so through some form of masking and illusion. So this takes up from previous writers, for example, Goyce, who talks about ideology in the pejorative sense. So, so the, the main point of um, Haslanger's analysis here is that for her normative analysis, um, efforts at social justice, as she puts it, um, typically focus on individuals or the state, but we also, according to Haslanger, need to address what's going on at the level of culture. We don't. We need to um, not overlook what's going on at the level of culture, cultural beliefs and values, in order to, um, you know, engage in efforts to promote social justice. So there are two elements uh, in the notion of ideological oppression. Um, one is an epistemic element. Uh, ideological oppression distorts, occludes and misrepresent, misrepresents facts. So that's sort of, it, it engages in um, mistaken um, epistemic presuppositions, if you like. And also it's a, it has a moral element. The distortions and occlusions enable unjust conditions. So um, precisely because of these distortions and occlusions, there's um, an implicit justification for, for activities and treatments and uh, hierarchies that are actually unjust. So as I said, you know, in this analysis of ideological oppression, there doesn't appear to be a social group condition, although, as I said, I'm a little tentative about how that might come into um, Haslanger's account. So one thing that Wyckoff points out is that the naturalisation of animals, of non-human animals, is inferior to, to uh, humans um, is a product of ideology. As he puts it, ideology serves to naturalise the subordination of animals' interests sustains the impression that the status quo is morally justified and also constrains imaginative possibilities by presenting contingent features of the world as natural and immutable. So thinking of animals as meat, for example, um, is, is one good, one good uh, illustration of, of this sort of process of naturalisation. You know, our beliefs and attitudes and values, just think of it as normal uh, to uh, treat dead animals as, as meat. Um, so the idea is that um, because of this notion of ideological oppression, right, that what social justice requires, what an anti-speciesism movement would require, like um, a feminist movement or an anti-racism movement, it would require a kind of ideology critique uh, at the level of cultural beliefs and values. And, and without this um, ideological critique, we won't actually achieve uh, the sort of social justice that they're aiming that we're aiming for. We won't um, disrupt the in intractability of the kinds of hierarchy that um, keeps in place the uh, injustice and the um, you know morally egregious treatment of non-human animals. So the way Haslanger puts it precisely is she says that culture is a network of social meanings, tools, schemas, heuristics, principles, and the like, which we draw on in action and which gives shape to our practices. 
And in certain recent work, she talks about how uh, we become enculturated and fluent in these tools so that they become not only seemingly natural, but also a precondition to functioning in cooperative interactions in the social world. So they're very much entrenched. And when this, as she puts it, cultural techne goes wrong, either epistemically or morally, so either of the two elements that I mentioned before can, can go wrong, this constitutes ideological oppression. And what we need in order to respond to this is um, ideology critique, which challenges, disrupts and replaces the cultural technique when it goes wrong. So I'm going to just, um, that's all I have as a presentation. Let me just um, go back and just quickly review. Yeah, let me just quickly review. So, I mean, basically it's the, there are sort of two main ideas in this um, uh, talk, as I say, very preliminary tentative um, ideas, but two main ideas, main, the first being that, you know, the, the automatic rhetorical extension from racism and sexism and other forms of oppression, structural oppression to speciesism, isn't quite as obvious as it seems. We need to sort of recharacterize the notion of a social group. Um, perhaps think of the category of animal as a socially constructed category rather than a descriptive category in order to make that um, extension uh, defensible. So that's sort of the first idea. And then the second idea is if we move to the notion of ideological oppression as outlined by um, Haslanger, um, which, as I said, you know, I'm not sure, entirely sure at this point in my thinking whether she can avoid the notion of a social group, but the way she articulates it seems to avoid the notion of a social group. Um, and, and what, but what this focuses our attention on is, you know, not so much structural hierarchy, but rather the importance of um, cultural uh, critique and ideological critique. So thanks.